So I wanted to make this video because if you look on YouTube about what is a PhD, you get a lot of adverts from universities trying to get you to do their specific course and go and do a PhD at their university, rather than an actual useful description of what is a PhD. So if you're thinking about doing a PhD, or you are doing a PhD, and you just need something to show your family who keep asking why on earth you're still at university, I hope this helped. But if you have any questions or any comments, then please let me know down there and I'll try and get back to you. What is a PhD and what is it like to do one? Well, as someone currently doing one, let me tell you what it's all about. I'm doing a PhD in theoretical physics, but most of what I have to say will translate to lots of different topics. In the UK, a PhD, or Doctor of Philosophy, is the highest award that a university can give you. And once you have one, you get to call yourself a doctor. Congratulations. If you study full time, they normally take three years to complete, but this can often be extended to three and a half or even four years. Many people do a master's degree before studying for a PhD, but this is certainly not a requirement and lots of people will go straight from a bachelor's into a PhD and they're very successful. The art of choosing a project to work on for your PhD can vary quite a lot depending on the topic you're studying. For example, most humanities, you'll have to write your own application, identifying a problem you want to study and suggesting ways that you might go about studying it. For other subjects, including physics, universities will often have a list of projects they're offering and you'll need to read through the list and apply to the projects that you find interesting and that you'd like to work on. This is exactly what I did when I applied for my theoretical physics PhD. If you're accepted onto the PhD, you'll typically have between one and three supervisors who are experts in the field you're studying and they'll help guide you through your PhD. Wherever you end up doing your PhD and whatever you end up studying, the most important part of your course is gonna to be to add something new to the pool of human knowledge, as this is the one big requirement for getting a PhD. One of the best descriptions I've seen of this comes from Matt Might and his illustrated guide to a PhD. Check out the description for links to his website and the longer version of this description. The idea is to imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge, and slowly you begin to colour in the bits that you've learned throughout your life. At primary school, you learn a little bit about everything, and you start to colour in the circle. At secondary school, you learn a little bit more, but still on a broad range of topics. Doing a bachelor's degree gives you more in-depth knowledge about your chosen specialism, and the colours start to tend towards your chosen topic. If you do a master's, you continue to specialise and gain a deeper understanding. Finally, when you start a PhD, you spend a lot of time reading to learn everything you possibly can about your chosen specialism and reach the edge of human knowledge. Seriously, so much of your time as a PhD student is spent reading to get to this point. It's then your job to keep pushing against what we do not know yet, until eventually, you push through and learn something new. And that bump, that bump is your PhD. This needs to be original work, but remember that your supervisors will be there to help you, so you won't be doing this completely on your own. It takes a long time to reach this point, somewhere between three and four years, and once you're done, you have to write a very long document called your thesis. And this contains a review of the subject you're studying, as well as the brand new work that you've done for your PhD. In my field, theoretical physics, it's quite common to publish journal articles throughout your PhD. So at the end, you can cannibalize them and you can write your thesis based on your papers. If you've done experiments as part of your PhD, your thesis will also contain this work, a description of what you've done, how you've done it, and your results. Writing the thesis is only the beginning of the end because once it's finished, it gets sent off to examiners and you get to go and start the rest of your life. However, a few months later, you have to come back to university and you have to defend your thesis in an oral exam called a VIVA. What this is, is an oral exam where the examiners will ask you questions about your research, as well as general questions about your topic, just to prove you really know your stuff and that you did all the work in your thesis. Typically, this is the part of the PhD exam that people find most nerve wracking because it's just you in a room with your examiners and it can last a long time, anywhere from a few hours to all day. Sometimes you even have to break and have lunch with your examiners. But once you finish and you pass, that's it. Congratulations, you're a doctor. Now, there is something strange that can happen at this point. If you finish your PhD and get a job that doesn't use your research area, for instance, if you get a job in industry, you can submit your thesis, go away for a few months and forget everything you've done, and then you have to come back and defend your work. So sometimes it is a shame that you can't defend your thesis right away, but I guess we should give these examiners a chance to read these 200 page documents that we write for them. So that's a broad overview of what a PhD actually is, but what's the day-to-day -day life like? What's it like to really do a PhD? Of course, this can vary a lot depending on the subject you're doing, but I can tell you about my experiences as a PhD student. One nice thing is, on the whole, doing a PhD, you get to choose the hours you work. Of course, there are meetings and seminars you will have to attend during the day, but when you're working by yourself, you can typically choose the hours you work. So you can work whenever you want, or whenever you feel you work most effectively. Now, this can also be a downside, because with so much freedom, it is very easy to procrastinate. But you must stay strong, and you must do some work. Daily life is typically reading papers, going to seminars, talking to people, such as your supervisors, about your work, and then sitting at your desk and trying to make some progress on whatever problem you set yourself. Be it coding, pen and paper work, lab work, or writing up, typically, most PhD students I know spend a lot of their time sat at their desk, 
staring at a screen. The autonomy that comes with being able to prioritize your own to-do list is great all the while that you're able to make progress, but if you get stuck, it can make it really tough. It can be quite isolating and typically very different to anything you've done before a PhD. If you get stuck on a problem that no one has ever solved before, there aren't that many people you can ask for help. And that's the true difficulty of doing a PhD, is the learning something new. So you're solving problems that have never been solved before. And typically there's a reason they've never been solved before, because they're quite difficult. All the easy problems have been solved already. I found it pretty weird the first time I asked my supervisor a question and they just respond with, I have no idea. During your PhD, you become the expert in your chosen topic. A word of warning, don't do a PhD if you think you want to learn everything there is to know. Most of a PhD is spent learning exactly what you don't know, which is a lot, and trying to answer just a few of those questions. You really start to know what you don't know. One of my PhD colleagues at Portsmouth said that one of the most important parts of doing a PhD is learning to be comfortable with your own ignorance and being comfortable not knowing the answers to questions. However, when you do learn something new, when you discover something that no one has ever seen before, that feeling is really amazing. And frankly, it's the reason a lot of people do a PhD, for that feeling of discovery and learning something brand new. Now, as I've said already, reaching this point of discovery can be very difficult, and a lot of PhD students do struggle with their mental health during a PhD. When you start a PhD, you need to be prepared to be honest with yourself and with others, your friends and family, and if you're struggling, you should reach out and ask for help. Most universities have places you can go, such as a well-being centre, where they'll offer you someone to talk to, and a lot of PhD students do use these places and find them really useful. During a PhD, you not only develop knowledge of your subject, but a whole host of other skills, including giving talks at conferences, writing scientific papers, talking to the public about science and trying to get them excited about your work, and much, much more. Your interactions with staff members in your department are also very different as a PhD student as to when you're an undergrad. You're treated much more on their level, like a colleague in the department. It's much more that you're working with them rather than learning from them. Another nice thing about doing a PhD is that it often gives you the opportunity to travel quite a lot. This can be within the UK, but also worldwide. And this is to go to workshops, to go to conferences, to visit collaborators in other countries, and most importantly, this is paid for by your university. So it's a great opportunity to go and see some places that you wouldn't otherwise get the chance to visit. Finally, I often get asked if I get paid to do a PhD, because some people think you're just being a student for as long as possible. And the answer is yes, you do get paid to do a PhD. Most PhDs are funded by either universities or government research councils. In my case, my university pays my course fees and they also pay me every month to support me while I do my work for them. PhDs in the UK are all paid the same, and at the moment it's about £14,500 a year. So it's a lot more than an undergrad gets in their student loan, but don't do a PhD if you just want to make lots of money. That's all I've got to say. Stay safe team, I'll see you soon.